Okay, it's going to be a review of SummerSlam 1995. Uh, I believe this is the last pay-per-view before the Monday Night Wars uh, came into a full effect. And I think you could definitely notice the difference between SummerSlam 1995 and Survivor Series 95. But yeah, we're going all the way back to August 27th, 1995 from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As Shawn Michaels even said in his book, 18,062 fans packed the igloo to watch the rematch between Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon in the ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship. Yeah, one of the few times uh, we, we saw someone uh, take full credit for the attendance for an Intercontinental Championship match. I guess Brett and Davey would be another one. But uh, yeah, the buy rate was 205,000. I think that's a pretty weak buy rate. That's... Uh, yeah, you know, it's 95,000 lower than SummerSlam 1994. I believe it's actually better than SummerSlam 96. I think SummerSlam 96 did barely a little bit under 200,000. So, yeah, but uh, bottom line is not a good buy rate. Uh, not a very good time for the company. But uh, let's get right down to it. I, th I definitely think you could argue this is uh, being the worst SummerSlam. But it does have one of the best SummerSlam matches of all time. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, first match tonight, we got Hakushi uh, taking on the 1-2-3 kid. I thought this was a good way to start off the show. It felt like something was definitely lacking here. I don't know what it was. I, I, I remember that they had a much better match on Raw. It was the night after Survivor Series. So, But I like the opener. I, I thought this was a good choice for an opener. You know, Hakushi, one of the few times Vince really got behind a Japanese talent and, and let him do his thing. Um, yeah, but, you know, high-flying, action-packed. I, I love the ending. Basically, Hakushi actually counters a spinning heel kick into a blue, you know, kind of a variation of a blue thunder driver. And uh, so I like the ending, but it, I definitely felt like they had a better match than him. And, and I kind of wish they got a little bit more time. But uh, yeah, I thought we got off to a pretty good start. Next up, we got Triple H making his SummerSlam debut as Hunter Hearst Hemsley taking on the race car driver in Bob Holly. Yeah, so this is uh, Holly with the long hair and the race car gimmick. I think the problem with this gimmick is... And, you know, a, a lot of these gimmicks are just kind of crappy. Uh, even the dentist was Kane. Kane was actually playing a dentist. But the race car thing, it's like, what's the point of it? It's like you can't you can't race a car uh, during the wrestling match. So it, I, I think it was one of those, you know, you had never had a race car driver gimmick before. So it, it does make sense. It was something different. But, you know, obviously that gimmick didn't have a lot of... Uh, lifespan when you think about it but yeah triple h here he was the granite snob i uh, thought he did a good job of playing the arrogant prick he had his nose in the air you know kind of acting like he was above everybody so yeah i, I think sean was actually saying that you know it was a cool gimmick but it, it definitely had a a shelf life to it and uh it's just amazing that triple h went from this to being the guy that bragged about having you know a bigger dick than bret hart you know just a couple years later and then he kind of morphed himself into you know, the toughest guy to ever walk down to the ring, as uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin would say a couple years later. So, yeah, the the transformation of Triple H was, was incredible. But, yeah, I thought Triple H looked good here. He looked in good shape. Uh, he bumped really well for Bob Holly. There was a beautiful counter from the uh, abdominal stretch, and uh, Bob Holly actually tossed him out of the ring. I thought that was cool. And, you know, Holly actually goes for a backdrop, and Triple H just really nicely transitions into the pedigree uh, to get to get the victory there. Yeah, I, I thought it was good, short and sweet, solid stuff. But you could definitely tell Bob Holly, uh, you know, that 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 gimmick just was not going to last. I, I I prefer the Bob Holly from 1999 and 2000 uh, over this, without a doubt. All right, next up we got the Smoking Guns taking on the Blue Brothers of uh, Jacob Blue and Eli Blue. All right, so this is where we're going to run into trouble. You just get the feeling people, you know, I think a lot of people just never heard of these guys. I mean, this is one of their rare appearances on. Uh, they might have been at the Royal Rumble. So basically, these, these guys are twins. They look like cavemen from like the Appalachian Mountains. So I get what Vince was going for. They just did not look cool. Everything about this match right here just screamed outdated. Uh, smoking Guns look pretty good here. They actually came in as baby faces. Some of the fans were a little bit against them. So the Blue Brothers actually did get a lot of cheers like from a lot of the male demographic at ringside. But uh, ultimately, uh, I thought Billy and Barkun looked athletic, and they hit their finisher to put this thing away a little bit over five minutes, and then we move on to the next match. We got Barry Horowitz <sighs> taking on Skip, and we got Sonny making her pay-per-view debut. So at this time, uh, Chris Candido was playing Skip, so this is before the body done. So oh, you almost forget that Sonny actually came in just with Candido. I always thought it was with... Um, 
not Bruce Pritchard, but, um, you know, Bruce, Bruce Pritchard, Dr. Tom Pritchard was the other uh, body don, I believe. Um, but yeah, at this time, they were like fitness gurus. You know, Sonny was coming out there with the fitness pros outfit and Skip. You know, they did this gimmick, gimmick before, I believe, with Simon Dean in 2005. But yeah, I, I thought, you know, Candido wasn't, it wasn't, it, it didn't really showcase his wrestling ability, but I thought he did play a good heel here. You know, Sonny was calling Barry Horowitz a loser, and uh, he was just this pretty generic guy. This didn't have much to him. He was kind of playing like an underdog. He actually did end up winning this thing thanks to Hakushi. So Hakushi just jumps into the ring, and then Horowitz actually hits a small package out of nowhere. And then they have this weird guy just promoting the merchandise throughout the whole show. It was just very corny. Uh, one of the worst things on the show. On top of that, you had this America Online stuff, which did not age very well. I thought it. I thought that came off very corny as well. But uh, but yeah, uh, bright spot about this match is just Sunny. You could definitely tell the the camera loved her. She was definitely engaging. But you know, I, I, Barry Horowitz wasn't a bad wrestler. It's just I, I just he, he's just one of those guys that you just couldn't get excited about. Just very little potential uh, to draw money. I hate to say I hate to say it. Uh, all right, next up, we have Alundra Blaze uh, defending the Women's Championship against uh, Bertha Fay with, with Harvey Whippleman. Okay, yeah, so so not not quite the um, showdown that Alundra had with um, uh, Bull Nakano over the years. Uh, they even touched on the match that they had on Raw, which, you know, it, it, it really makes you want to see. I know people commented on that and said they had a much better match than they had at SummerSlam. I believe it was in May of 95 on Raw. So if you haven't ha you haven't seen it yet, definitely check it out. You know, if, if people were commenting on how good it was and Vince even touched on it, um, you know, during the match here. So the Alundra Blaze bull matches, obviously they were really good. I was really impressed with the SummerSlam match, but, you know, apparently the match on Raw is, was must-see from the spring of 95. Uh, but yeah, but Bertha Fay here, you know, she's a very large woman. Um, I would actually compare her a little bit to Dewdrop. Um, so yeah, this wasn't a great showcase from Alundra. I, I think Alundra is very unique. It, it's kind of like this, you know, typical white girl that you really just don't, <laughs> she looks like she could be like a mom or something, you know, raising a family in the Midwest. I mean, she doesn't come off to me like someone that you would think would be, you know, wrestling in Japan and have all these great moves. But she's just so, she's really good. Uh, but she actually loses to Bertha Fay here. You got to wonder, maybe this was the start of the falling out between her and Vince. I know she was at Survivor Series, but, you know, eventually this led to her um, throwing the Women's Championship in the trash. But Bertha Fay actually gets the victory here. Harvey Whippleman actually cuts a promo with Jim Ross. And he's, he's like yelling at Jim Ross to keep his hands off of my girl, Bertha Fay. And uh, JR is like, I'm a happily married man. So, uh, but yeah, not a great match. Not a great showcase from Alundra. But she must have won the belt back Um you know, going into Survivor Series, and they must have had a falling out going into 96 with uh, Bischoff getting her to throw the championship in the trash. But, you know, it, it's a shame because she, 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 she really comes off like a good hearted, hearted girl. But, you know, Bischoff, um, you know, could be very manipulative when you start throwing that money around. So you could definitely understand it. All right. So next we have The Undertaker with Paul Bear taking on Kama. With Ted DiBiase. So Kama is actually the godfather. Uh, he had wrestled Sean at King of the Ring. And they went to a 15-minute 15, 15 time limit draw, which is unfortunate because King of the Ring 95 needed all the help it could have gotten, especially from Shawn Michaels advancing. But that did not happen. Yeah, so um, this comma push, yeah, pretty remarkable push that you're, you're in there with Shawn, you're in there with Taker. This is a casket match. So, yeah, huge push for uh, comma before the Godfather days. But, yeah, ended up falling a little bit short. I just couldn't get into this. Uh, Kama's offense just got no reaction, no heat. Um, you know, he wasn't bad in this match. It just, it just was not very engaging. So it's one of the few casket matches that I believe the undertaker actually wins. You know, you're so used to him losing casket matches, especially the one with Sean, um, you know, the one with Yokozuna, you know, you're, you're so used to seeing taker get screwed in this situation, but Paul bear actually, uh, looking like Jerry Krause as he, as he takes off the jacket and, and, and tries to prevent DiBiase from hitting the undertaker. So that was probably the highlight of the match for me. But yeah, Taker actually reverses the tombstone by the casket, 
And um, eventually he just throws Kama into the casket and gets the surprisingly clean victory. And, and Taker finally wins one of the few casket matches that he's won. I, I believe he actually beat Heidenreich, but not that many come to mind where Taker actually wins the casket match. But I got to give Taker credit. I thought he looked good here. You know, he actually had his uh, no sleeves here and he was showing off his tattoos. So... This might be some of the first times we saw the American badass Undertaker come out, just to kind of mention it. All right, next up we have Bret Hart taking on Isaac Yankum, DDS, the dentist. So uh, Isaac Yankum is actually Kane. He was actually hired by Jerry Lawler to take out Bret Hart. Uh, you know, at, at the time, you know, Bret and Jerry were still feuding, uh, believe it or not. But yeah, you, you know, the funny thing, funny thing about Bret and Kane it's when you go back to Survivor Series 97, you know, that's Brett's, you know, last match for the WWF for a long, obviously for a long time. And I believe that was actually Kane's debut against Mankind. So it's like uh, Brett on the way out, at, you know, never really got to touch Kane, uh, you know, other than this match right here. So Kane is playing Isaac Yankum. So if you haven't seen this match, Kane uh, is without a mask, obviously. He's playing a dentist. He's got like this uh, 80s mullet. And um, he's got pretty nasty looking teeth. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought Kane looked athletic here. Um, you know, you would think this is one of the best matches that Kane would have ever had. Um, I thought Brett actually, you know, I, I thought Brett's promo was probably the highlight of this match. You know, Brett cut a really good promo. Um, you know, just wrestling base, and I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, there's, there's really not much to talk about in terms of the actual match. But yeah, I thought it was going along great, you know. Um, Kane, even back then, is someone that I think it's very difficult to carry to a great match. I mean, you know, obviously Undertaker and Kane were booked to have something epic, especially at WrestleMania 14. I like that match. I thought Angle, you know, even though the ending kind of sucked, I, I thought Angle got a lot of good matches out of Kane. And, you know, Benoit got a really good match out of Kane uh, at Bad Blood 2004. You know, even the Shawn Michaels match against Kane from Unforgiven 04, I <sighs> You know, for a Shaw match, I thought even that was a little bit difficult to pull off here. But, you know, who knows how good this match could have been. You know, it, it really wasn't anything special. Uh, Jerry Lawler actually does get involved. And Brett actually gets his neck tangled between the two ropes. Very similar to the way Mankind used to do it uh, against Sean at Mind Games when he had his, you know, I, th I think he almost lost his ear in Japan when he did that spot. And, yeah, you know, he had his neck tangled up between the two ropes. And, you know, Jerry and, and Kane just start pounding on Brett. And it's actually a disqualification. Then you have all these referees just get into the ring trying to help Brett. And Brett starts shoving referees. And, it, yeah, Brett didn't look like he was happy here. Uh, neither did Sean. Like, uh, it, it just seemed like the morale of the company was pretty low here. Um, you know, my gut feeling tells me, and, you know, Bruce Pritchard didn't do any podcasts for, like, 93 to 95. It kind of leads me to believe that Nash was right, like around this time, it was just really Vince just kind of booking by himself. Like he kind of out, he had an outline of all these shows with the pencil backstage. And, you know, I don't think there was really a lot of help, uh, you know, maybe Doc Hendricks. So Doc Hendricks actually jumps on commentary uh, as Jerry Lawler is, you know, selling the beat down from Brett. And uh, yeah, I think that's another thing that really hurt the rest of the show. Doc Hendricks uh, on commentary th with this double main event just, yeah, I just thought it was pretty bad. I mean, just thought it was phony. It, even the character that he was playing backstage, it didn't feel like the real Doc Hendricks. It felt very watered down. And um, yeah, so next up we have the ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship. We got Shawn Michaels taking on Razor Ramon, uh, the rematch. Okay, I, let, let me start with the negative first. I, I would definitely say this. WrestleMania 10, especially watching this back, um, WrestleMania 10 is the much better match. I just thought it had a better flow to it. I thought it felt more natural. Uh, it, for whatever reason, Sean just looked like he was on more of a mission at that time. This felt like it was more of a chore for Sean. You know, just looking at the pre-match interview, he, he looked extremely stressed. He looked extremely, I don't know. I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's because you have expectations here. I mean, very rarely when you think about it, very rarely, um, yeah, obviously you get tons of rematches over the years, but you, you never really get a rematch, the same exact rematch with the same exact gimmick. I mean, could you really think of a, a rematch that had the same gimmick? It's, it's almost the equivalent of having like Kurt Angle and Shane McMahon having a street fight with you know the second street fight you you never seen anything like that so 
But, you know, with Sean and Razor, the WrestleMania 10 match was so monumental. You know, I, I know I know guys that love the WrestleMania 10 match that don't even like wrestling. Like, how many times in school has someone come up to you and said, yeah, I'm not a huge wrestling fan, but I do remember that match with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 10. That was pretty awesome. So I, I do remember, you know, you, the WrestleMania 10 match created a huge buzz. So you had to go back to it. You definitely had to. Um, the, the other knock on the match is Shawn looked extremely upset. And uh, it kind of threw a temper, te- temper tantrum here uh, because of the belt. They had a really tough time aligning the belt up properly. It looked like it was a little bit too high. And then towards the end of the match, he had a tough time pulling it down. And he just starts stomping. And, yeah, you could definitely tell he, he really lost his patience here. Very similar to what happened at SummerSlam 96, where he threw the temper tantrum against Vader. Uh, this time, he was it wasn't like he was mad at Razor. He was just mad at the situation. And then on top of that... I remember him talking about in his book, and it definitely makes sense watching this back. I mean, they weren't allowed to use the ladder as a weapon like they were in WrestleMania 10. I mean, some of the best spots from WrestleMania 10 was when Razor would just Irish whip Sean into the ladder, then Sean would take the big bump. And, you know, they really used the ladder as a weapon in WrestleMania 10. Here, they really had to kind of work around it, or they just had to do moves off the ladder. They had to incorporate an extra ladder just to do moves off the second ladder. And yeah, there was a lot of lag, you know, it, there really was a lot of dead air. But on a positive note, I like face versus face matches. I think Sean was a little bit upset that one of his first big matches as a babyface had to come against Razor, another babyface. It's kind of like, yeah, Sean was going to get booed by the, the men in the audience, you know, the, the guys that were going to boo Sean because of, you know, not having that cool factor because of the gimmick. So I, I think that played into it as well. But I'll say this, though. I, I still think Sean was a lot better in 95 than 94. So without a doubt, I think Sean's athleticism was, was actually a step up here. I thought they made the best of the situation. I mean, the razor's edge off the ladder was a great spot. Sean actually does a moonsault off almost the top of the ladder. We had never really seen that before. He does the big splash again. Uh, there was a sequence where he actually jumped off one ladder and actually fell onto the other ladder and hurt his knee. And Razor did some really good working over the knee. So I thought I thought that was cool. And um, yeah, for the most part, you know, it pretty much delivered. You know, the ending features Sean actually countering the Razor's edge into a backdrop. And uh, he actually botches the the belt, you know, grabbing the belt, and he has to. Then he throws the temper tantrum, then he goes up again. But you know, it all worked out. I thought this was a good rematch by far, the match of the night. I I would definitely say you could argue this as being a top four match of 1995. But I've kind of come to the conclusion the WrestleMania 10 match is a lot better, and um, this would not be my pick for best match of 95. If you want to argue that as top three, top four. I think that's fair, but uh, I think looking back on it now, I think Diesel versus Bret Hart is by far the best WWF match of 1995. But still still one of the best SummerSlam matches of all time. And um, if you want to argue SummerSlam 95 over 93, obviously this will be, uh, this will be the reason why this ladder match with Sean and, and, and Razor. <sighs> and then the main event, we got Diesel. Defended the championship against King Mabel coming off of the King of the Ring victory. So you had the King of the Ring fiasco. You went ahead and pulled the trigger. You might as well just have Mabel main event SummerSlam just to cash in on it. So one of the few times where the King of the Ring winner actually goes on to the main event of SummerSlam. Yeah, so, you know, I, I never really thought about this, but Mabel doesn't really get mentioned as, as you know, one of the few black wrestlers that, that Vince McMahon pushed uh, over the years. Uh, but, yeah, but, you know, give Vince credit. He gave an opportunity to uh, to Mabel. But, you know, the, the, the reason why fans uh, turned on him had nothing to do with him being black. It's just that he just wasn't very good in the ring. I, he just came off as one of these guys that was unusually large, unusually big. Uh, he kind of fit in with this you know, tag team hip hop gimmick with the King Mabel, the the attire. And uh, he just kind of came across as someone that, you know, was just able to make money from being big, uh, you know, put him in a wrestling ring, just see what he could get out of him. That's the mentality that I think a lot of people got from him. You know, just one of these guys that, you know, probably a lack of passion just didn't really want to be there. But uh, yeah, tough, tough, tough match to, uh, to rate right here. I thought Diesel really brought his A game in the beginning here. I thought he really worked hard. He actually did the he did the spot where he actually torpedoed himself out of the ring, the cross body over the top rope. I mean, you it's cringeworthy seeing Kevin Nash do that, but 
he was able to do it without get, getting hurt. So, so props to him. And then you had a lot of interference here from Sir Mo. You actually had Lex Luger come down and trying to play babyface, but for some reason Diesel attacked Luger. So this must have been the last time, one of the last times you saw Luger before he went to uh, WCW. So yeah, just the way he was booked on this show, the show definitely could have used him. You know, you definitely could have used guys like uh, Luger, Jarrett. But I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, just just really lethargic stuff from Mabel. I thought the ending was really crappy. Basically, Diesel actually wins this thing by doing a shoulder block. I mean, I, I understand Mabel's a, a large dude, but, you know, could we have come up with a way to, you know, get Mabel up for the jackknife without Nash killing himself? Maybe not. I guess not. Maybe that's asking for a little bit too much. But yeah, I, I would even say uh, uh, this this is this is one of the worst, maybe the worst Southern Slam main event to date. And just proof that the Diesel babyface push for the you know uh, main eventing pay per views with the championship just just was not working. So I'll, I'll just leave you with this one one of the one of the bad things about this show is you know you just have a lack of quality. Look look at the heels on this show. You got Hakushi, you got Kama, you got you got Kane as Isaac Yankum, and you got King Mabel. The, this has got to be the worst SummerSlam, one of the worst pay per views ever. You know, you, you need those quality heels, and this show just didn't have it. You know, the, you really could have used Jared here. Jared had a falling out with the company. I guess he temporarily left because he was upset with the um, the road dog situation where they split them up. So you didn't get Jared here. I would have preferred this. I would have went back to Sean versus Jared for the ladder match. I thought that would have been cool. And you, you have Razor actually take on Diesel in a face versus face match. You know, I'd be open to turning Razor heel, but I don't think it was, te you know, necessary. I think Razor and Diesel, you know, one year from the SummerSlam 94 match, I would have preferred that. You know, maybe even do Bret Hart versus Jeff Jarrett. You know, where's Owen and Yokozuna? You know, you definitely needed them on this show. So I, I, I just felt like, you know, this is a side effect of turning. I, I see why Sean was upset what, turning babyface. It's like, you turn Shawn Michaels' baby face, you still got Brett, Undertaker, Diesel, all baby faces. Razor Ramon, just too many baby faces, not enough quality heels. When you don't have enough quality heels, the product is just not as engaging. So, yeah, SummerSlam 95, uh, not a huge fan of it. But, um, you know, Shawn even said, I, this must have been around the time where Shawn went up to Vince and just said, hey, listen, everything sucks. Like, we, we, we need to change. And, um, you know, this is, I, I, you know, you, 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 you almost got to be happy now that, that we're in a situation now where Triple H and Shawn Michaels are, are getting that power again. Because, um, you know, even when you look back to SummerSlam 95, from what I remember, this from 93 to 95 were, you know, pretty much Vince McMahon, you know, very Vince McMahon driven uh, shows or, or, or very Vince McMahon driven product. And, uh, you know, you, so you, you definitely have to credit guys like Shawn Michaels and Triple H, um, you know, for getting for getting Vince to see the light and just, you know, being a little bit open minded as we get into the 95, 96 school year. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's SummerSlam 95 and I'm out. All right.